Thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to assume it's because you're very interested in this topic area and not because you are desperately getting your last CPD point for the CPD year. <laughs> so thank you for coming. And the last point. The la that's true. Maybe it's your first point and you're going to really go trying hard over the next 24 hours. Um, this is a topic that is kind of close to my heart. It is a topic that I wrote a paper on in 2019 with a colleague of mine. So I just want to give a shout out to her, Monique Robb, um, who did a significant amount of work. She and I um, created a paper on this topic in 2019 and Bruce and I have been updating it with some of the case law in the last few years. Yeah. Um, so Bruce Taylor and I are barristers here at Greenway Chambers that practice in family law, um, along with a few other people that sort of dabble in it, I, I would say. Yes. Um, so feel free to come and speak to us afterwards. We'll take questions at the end. Um, and if you want a copy of the slides, then just feel free to email us and you'll get a copy of the slides because there's no updated paper to go with it. All right. Um, so why is this topic interesting? Because every single person you know has a recording device in their hand. Uh, it's called a mobile phone or their smartwatch or their iPad <laughs> um, or they've bought some sort of button camera and they're taking recordings on that. So it is unfortunately very, very common in a family law context in particular, but it popped up in other areas. You'll see that some of the case law we give is in family provision or in employment law contexts. Um, but given that I'm primarily a family law barrister, a lot of the cases you'll, you'll um, hear about tonight are family law ones. So almost nine out of 10 of us own a smartphone. When you consider, just chiming in there, if you don't mind, Leah, it's only roughly been 13 years since Apple turned up with the smartphone. Imagine what it's gonna be like in another 10 years and where we're gonna be and the possibility of recording straight away. Anyway, I just yeah. that. One of the things that Bruce and I spoke about is how this area might evolve as deep fakes evolve, for example. So as people start to say, well, this is a video of what this person did at Changeover, and actually it's not a video of what they did. So it'll be an interesting area. But effectively, I think every second parenting case I'm involved in seems to involve some sort of recording that's been made in some context. So that's why this is an interesting topic to discuss. Um, so when might it come up? It comes up if there's family violence, not just in parenting cases. It could come up in property cases where there's a canon adjustment being sought, where one person says that the other perpetrated family violence on them. Um, it comes up if there's issues about child abuse. You might find your client starts um, recording the child making a disclosure. There's lots of leading questions being asked. Um, where there's changeovers, parents love to video changeovers of McDonald's and conflict and things that he said to me or she said to me. Um, or where there's just allegations in general about the conduct. This last dot point about de facto, I think that's interesting. I haven't seen it come up, but it could be used to say, well, we were in a de facto relationship. Here's a recording I took of us at that point in time and so if there was an argument about what if the de facto relationship existed it could come up in that context as well. I do also find that we've mentioned changeovers but it seems to me that a lot of these things occur from what I found at least um, after interim orders have been made in relation to something and somebody feels aggrieved about it or mm. it's not been correct because obviously evidence wasn't heard at that time other than statements being handed up. Um, so changeovers and those conflict areas are going to crop up increasingly um, uh, as, as we go through, let alone issues of child abuse, etc. I think there's also a temptation to think that the people doing the recordings are the quote-unquote victims of family violence. Sometimes it's the perpetrator that is making the recording and it's actually the perpetrator stalking someone or it's part of their coercive control. So don't automatically think the person that is recording is the victim. All right, so this is the rough um, plan of where we're going to go tonight in terms of you're going to be starting at what is, is the recording even actually illegal or not? That will depend on state law usually. And then we're going to look at if there's some exceptions. And again, that depends on what state you're in. We're going to turn to section 138 and consider whether or not you might need a certificate under section 128 for your client. And then if there is, if it's illegal, um, 
but it should be admitted anyway, the general exceptions under the Evidence Act. So that's the rough plan of where we're going. Okay, so at a Commonwealth level, um, it's generally unlawful to listen to or record communications without the knowledge of um, the person making the communication. So that's the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act, Section 6 and Section 7. We're going to be primarily focusing on state legislation um, and generally all states and territories, it's unlawful to knowingly record a private conversation you're not a participant in. So this comes up pretty frequently where um, maybe grandparents are at a changeover and recording something or they're recording a phone call that's happening between um, the parents that's on speakerphone. They just happen to be at their daughter's house and they record it. So that, that will automatically fall foul of all of the um, state and territory legislation. This is where we get a little bit different, where there's some exceptions. So in Victoria, Queensland and Northern Territory, it's legal to record a private conversation if you're a participant in the conversation and you don't need the consent of other people. So you'll find that there's very little jurisprudence in those areas on this particular topic, unsurprisingly, because it's ad admissible. Um, why this is important to know is because if you've got a case in a border town, so if you've got Albury Wodonga kind of case, you might actually be looking at the metadata or asking your client exactly what street did you take this recording on? Which McDonald's was it? Because if it happens in Victoria, then we'll be able to get it in more easily than if it was in New South Wales. And that's similarly the same. I've had matters um, for hearing in Coffs Harbour where the parties lived on either side of the Coolangatta border, um, some in Queensland and some in New South Wales. So um, there are issues, obviously, in those regions, less so in Sydney. Now, for uh, the majority of states, New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania, Western Australia and ACT, there is a exemption or an exception to the general prohibition about recording. And it is essentially this, you can record a private conversation if everyone consents to it, or if you get the consent of a principal party and it's reasonably necessary for the protection of lawful interests. And we'll go into what each of those little things mean. An important thing to note at this stage is that um, in ACT, the reasonably necessary part of the legislation is expressed as being subjective, whereas in all of the other jurisdictions that I've mentioned, it's expressed as an objective test. Okay, so I'm going to be focusing primarily on New South Wales. Um, we're obviously a chamber's base in New South Wales, but I was in Adelaide last week, so, so we obviously go um, interstate. But for the purpose of this talk, we're going to be mainly talking about the Surveillance Device Act, New South Wales. So some important definitions to note here. Um, first of all is who is a principal party? Um, that's someone who is a person by or to whom words are spoken in the course of the conversation. And the next thing that's important is what is a private conversation? So any words spoken by one person to another that may reasonably be taken to indicate that any of those persons desires the words to be listened to only by themselves. This has come up for me in a case where um, mum recorded dad effectively kidnapping one of the kids in a car park at a soccer game. And there was a big argy-bargy between mum and dad about whether or not it was in breach of the Surveillance Device Act, whether Section 138 applied. And I had to stand up and say, is it even a private conversation? They're screaming in a car park. <laughs> There's lots of other parents there. Did they really intend for it to be private or not? Uh, the court agreed with me and said it wasn't a private conversation. It didn't even need to consider the sections of the Surveillance Device Act. But there is some case law that you should know that even if it happens in a public place, such as a restaurant, it can still be a private conversation. So uh, if you're in a, or even if we're in a big restaurant and we're sharing a table, there might be a little sub uh, discussion down one end, which could still be deemed a private conversation. Now, this is another thing that I think is important to know. What kind of device is it? Now, most of this particular talk is going to be about listening devices, which is about recording audio. But uh, if you've got a silent movie, if I could call it that, 
then it could just be an optical surveillance device. It might not be a listening device. And the test under Section 8 of the Surveillance Device Act is significantly less stringent. Um, it could be a tracking device. There's lots of cases where one party says he was tracking me, following me, using find my iPhone, or he'd put something under my car, um, or a data surveillance device where they, one party's monitoring the other's computer. So be aware of that. I think a lot of the cases are really focused on listening devices, but just be aware that there are other types of devices and there are other sections of them in Section 7. I've put up there the other sections to have a look at, which include 11 and 12. Um, section 11 and 12 is about what you can do and possession of um, private recordings, for example. So there's a case, um, in pretty recent case, that Justice Christie determined, Sanders and Sanders, it's a 2022 case. That was a stay application by Dad. Um, and Her Honour in that case considers what should happen under Section 11. The kids in that case had been moved from Dad's care into Mum's care, and the day after that happened, there was a therapy session with the kids. The kids recorded themselves with a therapist. They also recorded themselves with the independent children's lawyer, and they gave those recordings to Dad. Uh, Dad tried to adduce that as evidence in the stay application as to here's what's happening to the kids and how traumatised they are by the move to Mum's care, and Justice Christie refused to admit um, that as evidence, partly on the basis because, one, there'd been an order that Dad had no contact with the kids, so he was in breach of that order. Um, but as a general rule, mm. we don't want to be encouraging kids to That's right, record and we'll people. come to that with one of the cases that we talk about as we go. But the court has said fairly firmly that they don't want to be encouraging children um, to take sides or, or to be jeopardising their own circumstances. Um, and such a recording may not um, necessarily be admitted, depending on the circumstance. So some to-dos for you as um, practitioners. You want to be asking, how did the recording come about? Was it deliberate? A lot of the times it's going to be deliberate, but sometimes it could be inadvertent. I don't know if you've ever said, hey Siri, and then something kind of pops up, right? <laughs> it could be an, in an inadvertent slip. And that will be um, can, the seriousness of whether it was deliberate or not could be considered when you're looking at whether it was how um, grievous the impropriety was. What state and territory was it made? So again, that's like border towns. You might want to look at the metadata of the recording to see exactly where it was made um, and get some instructions from your client, obviously, about how it came about. So if they say, oh yeah, I just pulled out my iPad and before I went to change over and pressed record, that will at least give you some context as to how it was. Or they might say, oh, my mum sort of videoed this and gave it to me. So you might need to understand how it was that it came about. Uh, as I said before, give some thought to, is it actually even a private conversation? And does the Surveillance Device Act even apply? And work out who were the principal parties to the conversation. So you might need to listen to it and work out who are the people that are being spoken to or are speaking and identify whether or not they consented to the recordings. Um, because as you'll see, if all the parties have consented, then you don't have a problem. But usually that's not the case. All right, so is there an exception to the general prohibition? So in New South Wales, it, it will be lawful to record if you have these three things. You need the consent of a principal party Usually that's the person that's doing the recording, so that's usually not a big hurdle. You need them to be protecting their lawful interests and it needs to be reasonably necessary to protect the lawful interests. Now, just on that point, the, when you look at Section 7, they're talking about at A, the consent of the party, and then B, it starts to break up into the lawful interests and reasonably necessary so there is some debate, is it a one-step, two-step type arrangement with reasonably necessary, um, or do they merge? And a lot of it, again, comes back to the facts of the actual matter and what the judge, I think, is thinking beforehand as to what they think they can hang their head on. This is a recent case I wanted to mention. This is a 2021 case um, that Justice Carey um, who is not a Sydney judge, was involved in. 
but it was a property proceedings only, no parenting, but um, the wife alleged that the husband had perpetrated family violence and she wanted to adduce evidence of a 16-minute recording. She said that as part of this recording that uh, he says the words, go on, record it. I don't give a shit, which he admits he said. But he says it 11 minutes in. <laughs> so for the first 11 minutes, there's a lot of scuffling and you can't really hear anything and you don't get the impression that he knows that he's being recorded up to the 11-minute mark. Um, Justice Kari, there was an argument about whether or not he'd actually consented by saying those words, and there's not much in the judgment about this, but Justice Kari actually found that those words did not amount to express or implied consent. Now, obviously, the difficulty with reading judgments is that we don't actually get to hear the recordings, but it could have been, for example, a threat, like, go on, record it. He might not have actually known that she was recording it at the time. So I can understand why Her Honour might have come to that conclusion, but it's difficult for us without hearing the tone in the recordings to make that assessment. And there was also some issues with respect to what was actually recorded. A lot of it was muffled or couldn't be heard properly in any event. So maybe all of those things together were the reasons that the judge used then to determine the way they did. In that particular case, Her Honour went on to consider the relevant sort of 138 and 135, um, but it's not super exciting for our purposes today. Okay, so what does protection of lawful interests mean, Bruce? We're looking back then, and I'm just we're really waiting for the slide for those that are viewing us on um, their computers. Um, the slide that kicks in is the matter of DW and R. It's an older case, uh, criminal appeal case in New South Wales, and really is a seminal decision um, with respect to the various indicia that the court will look at. Um, it was involving a matter of recording made by a 14-year-old complainant of sexual abuse by her father. Um, she had um, uh, had real issues about what was going on, so she decided to record using her, her telephone. Um, both parties, there was no issue that it was probative. But the interesting part was, and, and I think the court found the lawful interest existed, um, were some of the principles that the court outlined, which are still being explored in some of the family matters now, um, remembering that this was a criminal matter. Firstly, the desire of a witness to protect their credibility was one. Um, supporting the credibility if required to give evidence. Now, there's been debate on cases as to just how far that goes, and you'll hear a reference as we come across it to what's just in case. And people record things on a maybe, but they don't necessarily know they're going to use it. And just pausing there, one of the interesting things about DW was that the father had convinced the, his wife, who was the stepmother of the complainant, that the complainant was lying. So in that case, she was in a situation where she wasn't being believed by one of the other carers of, um, that was looking after her, and she was encouraged by another teenager. Um, in family law proceedings, it would be pretty common at an interim stage for one party to get an affidavit, um, which is from the other party, which says, I deny we had that conversation, I deny this happened, I deny that happened, they fabricated it to get more time with the child. And that might be a basis to say, well, I was concerned about um, that I was being told that I was a liar. I was concerned that he was saying he was fabricating all of these conversations and that's why I recorded him. And it comes really to lead to another indicia of the court looking at whether it's relating to a serious crime. Now, clearly, that sort of circumstance is um, a serious, serious matter. Um, to protect a lawful interest. And most of the cases that have followed subsequently to DW uh, reiterate that same sort of circumstance, that where there is a criminal interest, a criminal potentially activity, it's potentially very serious, somebody needs to protect their interests against that, um, then in most of those cases you'll find that these things are allowed in. And we'll come to another case where that's a bit more blatant um, as we go through. Um, it's not necessary... I think worth remembering, it doesn't need to be a legal interest per se. It's an interest, a lawful interest that the person may have. And this comes back, although New South Wales looks at an objective perspective, 
um, some of the other states look more subjective. Um, and as uh, Leah said, uh, ACT looks from a subjective perspective. But in any event... I'm more for interest as well, right? That's, that's true, yes. <laughs> it can't be, I'm recording you so that I can blackmail you. <laughs> yeah. That would not count. Uh, clearly then, on the, in the circumstances and the facts raised in DW and R, the child's lawful interest not to be a victim um, of a serious criminal offence was taken um, into account and accordingly the recording was admitted. That leads us though to a discussion of some of the civil aspects too and the next slide that we have is not a criminal case but a civil matter, um, decision of Justice Henry in um, Kanjian Holdings um, and we've included the quote because what is said, I think, um, really embraces a number of the issues. Uh, it's worth, worth considering, and I'll just read it out. While lawful interest is capable of a broad construction, the statutory context suggests it is not open-ended. The recordings of a private conversation, just in case, might prove advantageous in future civil litigation is not enough, so there must be more. Uh, the court is, however, more likely to find that a recording is made uh, in the protection of a person's lawful interests where the conversation relates to allegations of serious crime, such as DW, as I've just said, um, or resisting such an allegation, or where a dispute has crystallised. And I think that's an important point too. Whereas the just-in-case, I'm just recording it because you never know, it might work, it might not. But if something subsequently crystallises in a need whether it's to do with credit or otherwise, into a real and justifiable concern, as the court says, about the potential or significant harm, um, then that may amount to then a lawful interest. Um, so remember, there's a, a bit of a step that the court takes through these things to, to consider all of the issues. And as um, uh, Leah has said, that there's a number of nuanced aspects that have to be considered more so in New South Wales. And this is why New South Wales leads the way with respect to the interpretations because there's just a little more added on to the legislation that the courts have to look at. Uh, this was also discussed in another matter, in a civil matter, um, a case called Nanosecond and Karen, which was a South Australian decision um, in, and that was considered in a case, a New South Wales case of Rothwell um, per uh, Justice Rees. It was a family provisions matter, and in that case, the judge considered criminal matters, circumstances, and cases where these legal interests had arisen, looked at civil, a range of civil matters, also other family provisions matters, um, as well as representational issues, misrepresentation, etc. It's quite a thorough case, and I certainly recommend um, that you have a look at it, given that it's a fairly recent case of 2020. Um, but in that, the judge adopts what's been said by uh, Justice Boyle in the South Australian case, and again in a handy little principle paragraph, um, Justice Boyle, and it's quoted by Justice Reith, uh, Justice Boyle says, drawing all of the above interests together, it remains the case that the concept of lawful interests is of uncertain content. So we're looking at factual issues. While some general propositions hold true and some guidance may be gained from a consideration of the authorities, the issue of whether a recording was made for the protection of a person's lawful, lawful interest remains one very much anchored in the facts of a particular case. On that basis, consider, after considering those, Justice Rees had four areas, as it were, that he thought was important when looking at lawful interests. One was whether the purpose of the conversation was to obtain admissions in support of a legitimate purpose. Um, the next was whether it was important to protect oneself from being accused of a fabricated conversation or other circumstances. Um, third thing was there, and we'll discuss this a little further later, whether there are other practical means um, of recording the conversation. Perhaps somebody could have taken notes um, Justice Rees um, on that point where um, the, he accepted that the person who had taken, which was one of the sisters to the family provision matter, 
had taken the conversation, recorded the conversation, was because um, it was felt that any written note may well have been questioned as to credibility of who created it and whether it was truthful. So on that basis, looking at the various indicia, the, the recording of the conversation that was held with the woman's father was found to be lawful. One of the, four, the fourth issue he addressed, and again we've said it before, was this just-in-case issue. Recordings of conversations made just in case I might need it later on, I don't know, um, where there is a dispute or for the sake of making an accurate record um, is simply not enough. There needs to be more than just that, that you think you might want it for some future purpose. Um, got to be something that really, as the judge says uh, in Kanjan, has to crystallise into something that was real and identifiable. So picking up on... Are there other ways that it could be recorded? One of the issues in DW was that a 14-year-old might not necessarily know that they have the right to go to the police and complain. And so making a surreptitious recording in that circumstance is perhaps more understandable than an adult who's fully aware that they could make a complaint to the police and it could be recorded. So um, in terms of other avenues, the maturity of the person that's actually making it and the age of the person that's making the recording is relevant in that regard. Yes. So in family law, give us some examples, Bruce. We've got two matters here, one slightly older, but it, it still counts and we were, we were discussing whether we should you know, forget about the older cases and just look at the newer cases. But really, these are grounding cases, these, some of these older ones. And Gawley and Bass is one of those, 2016. The father installed a listening device into the mother's home due to concerns about the mother's abuse of the children. Uh, and he sought then to ad adduce an affidavit which contained a transcript of the recording. Um, the court, looking at all the various circumstances, held that the father's lawful interest was extended to the protection of the children and their interests, um, as he had a responsibility and obligation created by parental responsibility um, to ensure the children were safe. So on that basis, the court found uh, that the recording could go in. Uh, another case more recent is Lou and Bassett. Uh, again, it was a changeover matter. Um, where the father recorded the mother yelling and pushing um, in a car park area. Uh, Justice Christie found that the father's lawful interests included the parental um, capacity to communicate. Was that a factor? Uh, their lack of ability to co-parent. Clearly, the two were going to argue the whole time. Um, and the exposure of the child, uh, in that case, to family violence. So these were all lawful interests that the court was willing to concede on behalf of the father and allow the recording in. But you should consider at that stage, if you're acting for the party that says, I can't communicate with mum, she's awful at changeovers, but I'm still seeking equal share of parental responsibility and that the kids should spend time with mum on a substantial and significant basis, you might run into some problems down the track, right? So it might be, it might have been reasonably necessary to protect your lawful interests, but is that really an issue in the case? If we, if you're arguing about whether they should spend five nights a fortnight with mum or six nights a fortnight, so just be aware of that. How consistent is um, the recording and the allegations that you're making with your case theory? Yeah, that's right. Um, the other limb that we mentioned earlier, not just lawful interests, but what is reasonably necessary. Um, and we go back to DW and R, uh, where the judge said in that case that it was uh, objective um, perspective um, on considering all of the grounds of the case that exist at the time of making the recording. I personally think that um, it depends on what the judge is after with respect to whether they're going to consider reasonably necessary or not at all. Sometimes they'll just look to the lawful interests and if there are lawful interests, then it must have been reasonably necessary for them to do what they did. But in other circumstances, it might be the other way around, that in order to exclude, they may say it wasn't um, reasonably necessary. They could have done something else if there was evidence of 
reporting to people, um, taking notes um, and keeping it that way. But as I said, each of those can be criticised on their own anyway. Um, it's really just then coming down to the circumstances of what is reasonably necessary in the broader overall circumstances. Um, in the case of an abused child in DWNR, um, the position of the person making the recording, that is the child, um, clearly the child's in an abusive relationship with their parent. Um, were there any alternatives? Leah has said, how can you expect a 14-year-old to wander off to the police station and say, oh, this is happening, by the way? Far easier. Otherwise, parents are perpetrated. Yes. Mm. Far easier to use what's at hand. They're familiar with a device, a recording device on their phone. They can use it, and they did so. It's really important to understand that the case law makes it clear that it doesn't need to be essential to the protection of lawful interests. So reasonably necessary is not as high as essential to protect. It's a, it's a somewhat lower standard. Um, but certainly when Bruce and I were discussing this earlier today, it seemed like, uh, unfortunately, the case law, when you sort of work through it, it seems like sometimes the judges say, well, I want to exclude this, and they work backwards sometimes, because there, uh, there hasn't been a lot of nuanced discussion in the family law cases about was it reasonably necessary. And it's not necessarily a two-step um, process either. They're, they're in the phrase in, se in um, Section 7.3. Um, if you have a look, um, it's part of it. You've got the consent. Then it was it really necessary to protect lawful interests. It doesn't say it's a two-step process, but sometimes it's interpreted that way. Um, but as I said, for instance, in Rothwell, um, the family provisions matter I mentioned before, uh, the judge looked at, well, could this um, sister who was recording the father's conversation have written notes um, of what was going on? And would that have been then tested as to her credit? Um, because in the circumstance of family provisions matter, obviously the father has died and they're in dispute in relation to, to who's beneficiary and who's receiving what. So a little too late because that person can't give evidence. Um, highly likely that any written notes could well be criticised as being subjective notes, if not a fabrication. Yeah. Self-serving, created after the fact. Yes. Those are the types of allegations. Whereas if you've got a recording that has the metadata of exactly when it's been, when it's been taken and you can hear the voice of the deceased, yes. that you can understand why that might um, be more weighty evidence in that context. Absolutely. So there's another example as well of a criminal law yes, in the ACT. It's, it's an ACT case. It's three years ago, R and EP. Um, the woman made the complaint to the police uh, that the accused had threatened to disseminate sexually explicit images of her. The woman uh, later found on her driveway at her home an intimate image of herself. Um, she then made a covert recording of a conversation with the accused in which he basically said, you have to have sex with me um, for three months, um, uh, otherwise he would spread further images of her more publicly. Is that not you can't refuse? <laughs> <laughs> well, she obviously um, decided to refuse. It was clearly blackmail in the circumstances uh, and the recordings were admitted on reasonable grounds. But in essence, um, I just don't see that the reasonable grounds was necessary it was a serious issue um, that she was being threatened and the court could have just let it in on a lawful interest anyway. But they looked at the reasonable grounds aspect considering that it was necessary to protect her lawful interests. So in family law, like we said, there's really not um, much discussion about this, but in Corby and Corby, again, it's an older case, but it gets referred to. Um, the recording was made and it was in relation uh, to a victim that was in a violent and abusive relationship. It wasn't realistic to expect that victim to go necessarily to the police. As we know, the nature of family violence is often behind doors. It's difficult for victims of family violence to gather evidence. It's difficult for them to tell their family and friends about it, let alone the police. So um, the evidence may lead the court to conclude that a child's presently at risk in one person's care, in one parent's care, then it's more likely to be reasonably necessary to protect lawful interests. And that was picked up in Gawling and Bass, much the same thing, reasonably appropriate or reasonably necessary in the context of a recording in relation to the alleged assault of the child. 
All right, so what do you do when you're acting to someone and you don't think that the exemptions apply? It doesn't seem like it will was lawfully, uh, was to protect their lawful interests and reasonably necessary. Then we get into thinking about Section 138 of the Evidence Act. So there will be circumstances where um, automatically you're in breach and the exemptions don't apply. So remember when I said that um, if you're not a participant to the conversation, then you're recording it and you don't get the exemptions. If you're not a principal party, you don't get the exemptions. Or if you are um, recording it where it goes to issues that you, that maybe a little side issues, that they're not the main game, it might not have been reasonably necessary to record in that particular instance. So you might not fall under the exemption. So then if it's prima facie illegal, does that, is that the end of the question? Is that the full answer? No. Section 138 says that illegally obtained evidence or improperly obtained evidence can be admitted. Just on the um, not being a, a party to the conversation, there was a case that was mentioned earlier about a father basically bugging in the mother's house and recording the conversation with the mother and children. So that would have been a case where the person, there was, unless he told the children that they were being recorded, no one have known they have been recorded there. In essence, that's the reading. No one knew um, so until he produced the recording. Yeah, so it was prima facie illegal. Yeah, so, so but still the reasonable legal interest can override the fact that no, there's no principal party in the conversation. Yeah, if no one knows they're being recorded and you weren't part of the conversation and you're the one doing the recording, then you don't even need to jump through those hoops of was it reasonably necessary because you don't get to that. You need, you need to actually have one of the parties to the conversation consenting. So, because in that case there was no parties consenting, how do you get admitted to the So under 138, so section 138 of the Evidence Act says that you can admit um, illegally obtained or improperly obtained oh, evidence absolutely. if the desirability of admitting it is outweighed. It doesn't have to be substantially outweighed, and we're gonna go through what that looks like with a different section, but as long as it's outweighed by the undesirability of admitting the evidence that's been obtained in that particular way. So in parenting proceedings, there's really a weighing up of two public policy factors, right? On the one hand, we shouldn't be encouraging people to break the law and we shouldn't be encouraging people to make covert recordings. On the other hand, if the evidence is really important and a child might be at risk, then it's more important that the judge sees that evidence and hears that evidence so that they can make a decision about what is in the child's best interest. So those might be the competing elements in family law proceedings involving kids. And that, you can see, is largely discretionary. The judge then, based on all the circumstances, will decide which way it goes, desirable or undesirable, depending. So Section 138 has a non-exhaustive list of factors. Um, this is taken straight out of the section. I'm not going to read it, but I do want to bring in um, the difference between probative value of evidence and importance of evidence. These are two different things. Um, it was discussed very recently in a 2020 case, Kadir and the Crown. It's a criminal case. Um, the High Court pointed out that evidence might possess a high probative value but not really be important in the case if there is other equally probative value evidence available. So you'll find this, this comes up pretty often where um, parties will want to have a recording but they'll already go into their affidavit as to exactly what was said. And so if there's already evidence in the affidavit about what was said, do we actually need the recording? Therefore, it's not as important. It might still have probative value, but not that important. And therefore, that's one of the factors to consider about, is it desirable to let it in? So there's some examples of where Section 138 has been um, explored and considered in family law context. And again, we start off in the, um, the older cases, Graverman and Gorman is one. Um, if you've been to these sort of seminars before in relation to COVID, you'll hear this one. Um, trotted out a number of times, but in this case, uh, the three kids uh, live with the mother, spent time with the dad, the father wanted the children to live with him, those are his orders he was seeking, and he alleged that the mother 
was violent and psychologically had psychologically harmed the children. Similar fact basis to what we had been talking about previously. Um, the father recorded the conversation between himself and the mother without her knowledge and consent and sought the recording to be admitted. So under 138, as we've said previously, they were admitted. The court said um, in uh, over in another one of our slides, we've got the quote there for those that are at home, uh, the desirability of admitting evidence of family violence in a hearing where the best interests of the children are paramount outweighs the undesirability of admitting evidence which was obtained unlawfully. Can I just ask, with the bugging, sorry to... No, no, we ask encourage any interaction. <laughs> the bugging case, I forget the name of it. Um, for him to have bugged the mother's home, does Corbyn, the fact Corbyn. speaks... Yeah, that one. Does the fact speak to how he got into the house and bugged it? Oh, it just doesn't make we, sense. We it? don't know, I but it, it, yeah, um, he could have he could have been invited in. It might have been for a party. It could have yeah. been a, a relative social circumstance of some. But it's not hard to plan a device. Um, he might have also had a set of keys. Um, yeah. There's nothing to say that he was excluded from the mother's premises. It might have been. I, my, I don't quite remember if it was the former matrimonial home in that particular case. But it's not hard to, you know, have a teddy bear which has a camera in it, like well, nanny cam stuff. Let's assume he was, he broke in. To admit that evidence, he would then be admitting to a crime. Illegality, so, yes. So he would have to um, deal with that issue as well. well as well, yeah. but again, there's two illegalities in yeah. essence. One is the recording and the other yeah. one is whether he broke in. But again, the court under 138 will look at the desirability Section of the church. versus the undesirability. Um, but just because it's a parenting matter doesn't automatically mean it will get admitted. And in fact, this is a 2022 case of Justice Campton, Najim and Najim. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a pseudonym, so I guess I can make it up how I pronounce it. Um, this one was an interesting case where it was the paternal grandfather was the applicant. The respondent was the mother. One of the other respondents was the father, but he really wasn't engaged in the proceedings at all. He didn't participate. And um, Talking about my case. Oh, really? There you go. Well, you'll, you'll probably know more about it than yes, I will. Um, one of the allegations, so granddad, paternal granddad wants the kids to live with him and he's seeking an injunction against mum from um, bringing the kids into contact with maternal granddad. The reason why is because he says maternal granddad sexually assaulted the mother when she was about 13. Um, he has a third party who's named Miss F in the case and Miss F says oh yeah I heard the mum speaking about um, her rape when she was 13 and so the granddad says well can you get mum on the phone and and put her on speaker and we'll see if we can induce it out of her that this is what's happened. Get her to admit what happened. So he gets that to happen and he gets this third party to speak to a woman who he recognises is the mother and he starts surreptitiously recording on his phone the conversation. Now the recording is not what is adduced because the conversation is not in English. So what is tried to be adduced by the paternal grandfather is a translation of the recording. And the translator says, um, this is such bad audio quality. There was an issue, I think, about how dad had recorded it and he tried to put it on a USB and there was, we, we don't know too much about it. Well, I know lots about it. Well, you know lots about <laughs> it, but I, I only know what's in the ex temp judgment from Justice Campton. Um, but effectively, the transcript is um, hugely incomplete. incomplete with illegible parts in it where the translator can't get anything. So a lot of what is being alleged can't really be shown up on the recordings. Um, sorry, not the recordings, in the transcript. Is that correct? Um, well, uh, at um, interim hearing for Judicial Registrar Campbell, we actually had that evidence submitted. And um, we relied on a case, and I can't remember what statutes were referred to, but I assume it was the Commonwealth, rather with the Commonwealth Evidence Provisions. But uh, an observation made by a, um, the, the judge hearing the authority relied on was that uh, it's very difficult to prove things that happened in family situations, which are critically important. And that weighed heavily in favour of uh, Judicial Registrar Campbell admitting the evidence. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, it was very clear what was. You might be able to refer who I thank you for. Um, 
Um, and uh, it's apparent that Judicial Register I can will agree in the lower court. However, by, a couple of years down the track, um, the mother had moved on and the evidence was she, you know, she attended this course and that course, knew how to parent and she was really great now and everything was in the past. And so uh, there was a great deal of sympathy for, uh, for somebody who, who had played a, a role in, in what appeared to be a horrifying and factual history of her life. And, and so she had turned a corner, as it were. Well, that, that's that's what the findings, you know. And yeah. Maybe she has, but it yeah. wasn't my job to uh, uh, <laughs> dig into that too deeply. Well, 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 it was my job to dig into that, but it wasn't my job to enthusiastically embrace those, those conclusions. But if she had, that's great. But the point being that, um, uh, it, you know, as is so often the case in life, I think the, the findings of Justice Captain might have. Um, Inconsistent with a policy that he, or a view he'd taken of the case, well, he, he was just so unsavoury. His well, <laughs> <laughs> from your perspective. Well, interestingly, <laughs> this, this is why I think it's an interesting. And, and, I, point. and I think I think I think it was clear from recordings what she was alleging. Well, he he says Justice Campton says the third party was not on affidavit. That's Miss F. Yes, Miss F. And the reason for that the was transcripts were. In, I'll finish off on the yeah. three points. The transcripts were incomplete. Mm. Because they were of poor quality yeah. um, and and failed to record the totality, as it were, yeah. of the conversation. Um, and the paternal grandfather was already on affidavit with his recollection of the conversation. So and that again, part wasn't object. Uh, yeah. Either that part was objected yeah. to and it was admitted in, yeah. or well, it wasn't in, objected in, to. In so there was already that. She acknowledged that she had said all those things that we were alleging in, in that mm. what the paternal grandfather had said. So it was, it was difficult. But um, we actually had, there was an excellent recording of Alan, whose granddad, of course, was a, you know, an, old, an, old, an old guy from another country, and, and he had one of those Mendel things, he was recording it on a tape recorder, pressed the button and the way he went. And uh, there was a much better recording available, but uh, the solicitor who originally acted for him um, had destroyed all his files and had been involved in all sorts of inquiries, investigations, and eventually pulled back into suicide because of his, the terrible life he was leading. So we, we, and I spoke to him before he did do that, but we, he, he, he had no compunction about the fact that this best evidence that was in his hands had been destroyed under his watch. Oh, goodness. And, and the, the woman who was, um, who, who, the woman who... Record, was who the record, third party. Who was the other party, was on affidavit, but she refused to be, to be participating in cross-examination, so I wasn't able to tend to her evidence. Why didn't she was get, so scared of being involved. Why, why, didn't, why didn't you subpoena her? Well, I said, I, if, if I, well, the only reason I... Well, we were able to use the evidence in the interim hearing, and I, I gave her my undertaking that I wouldn't subpoena, and if my client instructed me to subpoena, I would have ceased to act. Wow, there you go. So Judge Campton found against your client? Correct. Well, no, no, it was Campton, yeah. Yeah, Campton. Campton. Yeah. But, but so, you said yeah. Judicial Register Campbell. Judicial Register Campbell. 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 You don't get this in a seminar every day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I was going to talk about well, there's a. I was going to talk about that case where... Uh, the, the judge we relied on authority in the interim hearing two years before, where the judge actually found in that case that the it's so difficult to prove that things happen in a domestic setting. Well, a, a lot of the that, cases that, that confirm that. in favour of admitting evidence. Well, I mean, yes, as one of the circumstances. Mm. So, again, a broader look, mm. Judicial Registrar makes a determination, but when it finally reached... Uh, yeah. Judge Campton decided otherwise. Justice yeah. Campton. Justice Campton, and sorry. This is one of the few, thank you for that, this is one of the few full court cases that considers Section 138 because one of the issues was whether or not the trial judge had made an error um, admitting or rejecting the evidence under Section 138. Um, that was the recordings that had been made by the father um, they were with the children. They were relevant to family violence and the emotional impact on of the arrangements on the kids. Um, the trial judge refused to admit the recordings and the full court said that they agreed with that decision. The recordings had low probative value given the summary was already in the father's evidence. Um, so again, if your client's already on affidavit saying here's exactly what the conversation, um, how it went, then it's quite possible that they'll say, well, why do we need the recordings just to hear what's already written down in paper? Um, but also, and this is where you've got to look at... Um, when you disclose the recording, because obviously there's disclosure obligations, but at this in this case, it wasn't disclosed until the actual final hearing. So there was significant prejudice to the mum, and depending on um, the whether you're the applicant or the respondent, 
it may be the case that cross-examination of the other party has already happened. So if the recordings come about and sort of by surprise, we're not meant to be doing uh, litigation by surprise, but if it happens in um, cross-examination, for example, that matters are put to it, then there's a significant prejudice because the other party can't be cross-examined unless there's an application to reopen. Well, e even at, at the commencement of the final hearing and somebody stands up and says, I've got these things I want you to admit, um, you're going to have to stop everything and then make a determination. So it's not just final hearings that um, recordings come up in. They can also come up in contravention applications. Um, Callanan, that's a 2014 case. Um, but the father sought to produce a transcript of a recorded phone call between the children and the mother and um, Judge Scarlett, as his honour then was, um, refused to admit the transcript saying that we shouldn't be encouraging kids to um, take recordings uh, about with, with their parents. Yeah, because in essence he went on to say he doesn't want to encourage a partisan attitude for the children. Um, they shouldn't be involved in taking sides. I've been involved in one case where their um, child made a covert recording off their own bat and ended up giving it to the independent children's lawyer and it ended up being um, disclosed to all the other parties and it was admitted in that particular case. There's no judgment on it because um, ultimately the matter settled but it we settled on I think day six of day nine of a nine day hearing um, but it was an interesting case in that part of the reason it got admitted into evidence was it was clear that the child was subject to serious emotional child abuse. Um, so Kristen, a, a segue from this issue. Um, I talked um, a moment ago, um, quite openly without disclosing any um, names, about that case. I'm assuming, and this is a seriously, this is, I, I asked this question with, uh, with, with uh, intent and interest. Um, to, to what extent does that go close to infringing a sanction against public um, publicising um, material from a family law case, which is generally privileged? It is generally privileged, but not always. I mean, the the, part, the, the cases are, are published, mm. admittedly and anonymously. Yeah. But you know, if people are scrupulous, um, they can find these things yeah. and find the names that are referred to, because yeah. it's not every party that's anonymous. It's just the applicant and the respondent parties. Yeah. More or less, but if somebody oh, else, they anonymise everything. Yeah. They yeah. not. I I've been in. I um, know one of the women that used to anonymise all the cases, and they anonymise occupations and Twitter yeah. handles and addresses and mm. suburbs. Sometimes uh, languages often is um, is anonymised. So you'll find, but you'll section one two one has specific carve outs usually for legal education. So, um, yeah, in most cases. I mean, people can still read it and figure things out for yeah. themselves. Yeah. There you are. All right, and um, let's move on to, I'm just conscious of the time, we don't have too much longer. Um, so Section 128 Certificates. Now, this is a really tricky area if your client's the one that's made the recording um, and wishes to adduce it. The reason it's tricky is because Usually, you can only get a Section 128 certificate if you're being compelled to give the evidence. That is easy when it's cross-examination, because if you're being cross-examined and they're asked questions about it, you can quickly stand up and say, hold on, I need to potentially get a 128 certificate for my client. It's trickier when you want to get it as evidence in chief. Um, there is a good case to go on. It's a 2018 case which discusses when you might be able to get a Section 128 certificate. It's Field in Kingston, 2018, um, 58 Family 429, and it steps through the requirements. But it has to be required or compelled. Um, so it's not good enough to say, oh, well, there was an order which said I had to file an affidavit by such and such a date. That's not good enough. You might be able to get an, a Section 128 certificate in advance of filing an affidavit if the affidavit is ordered to be on a very specific topic. But if it's not, then you might have some real problems. So there, there was a case that I was in where I had to apply for it. The mother was being cross-examined and it was abundantly clear that the um, father's um, counsel was 
about to cross-examine her on a document that she had signed off on, which in essence was fraudulent. Um, so I jumped up and said, you know, Your Honour, we request a Section 128 um, because she was being compelled to answer the question. Um, so we made sure we had that before the matter proceeded. The judge did order the Section 128 certificate and then uh, the mother proceeded to answer the questions. And the matter subsequently, shortly thereafter, was settled. Now, just because you've objected or a witness has objected to giving evidence doesn't mean that the court will require them to give the evidence, but if they do require them to, um, they might provide the certificate, and then the certificate means that the evidence they give can't be used against them in an Australian court. However, you might think, well, I'm compelled to give the um, documents, the recordings I've made under the disclosure rules. So isn't that enough? No. The disclosure obligations are not enough to provide compulsion. That's what Field and Kingston says. Certificates aren't retrospective. So if you can't unscramble the egg, if your client on, on an interim basis, maybe they were self-represented, went into an affidavit um, saying I've made this recording and here's the recording, they've already gone into evidence about it. So the best you might be able to do if you find out that your client has made a recording, um, you might be able to get a direction that they give evidence on a very specific topic. I had this um, happen a couple of years ago where my client had in her trial affidavit said, um, I haven't done any drugs in two years. And then a week after signing that trial affidavit and swearing it, the um, test the, comes back positive for meth. <laughs> So I'm sitting there thinking, how are we going to get around the perjury issue? She's clearly perjured herself. So she ended up having to go on affidavit and say, I wish to give evidence. I acknowledged that what I'd previously said was incorrect, but I wish to give evidence about that. I wish to say more about it, but I don't want to say it without a certificate. In, there could have been a very logical explanation in COVID where if you're doing a trial affidavit and um, you've sent various drafts to your client to inspect, Maybe they had given you instructions and said, oh, actually, that paragraph's not correct. You need to fix it. And maybe the solicitor just didn't fix it. That could be an innocent explanation, right? That wasn't in my case <laughs> what had happened. Yeah. Wishful thinking. Um, ultimately, I ended up getting the matter thrown out on standing because I said that the applicant didn't have standing to even bring the application. So I didn't need to worry about the fact that my client had um, taken drugs. But... It is, if you were going to try and seek the certificate, do it early. If you, you should add a pre-trial um, proceeding, whether it's at the compliance and readiness check, you might need to flag the issue um, so that you can hopefully try and get a 128 certificate at do that you, stage. Do you know anyone who's ever been prosecuted? I've never heard of actually happening a prosecution for a breach of the act. I'm sure it must exist, but I've never actually heard it materialising. Well, we're coming I was say, we shortly. are going to come to one example. We're, we're coming, coming shortly to, to an issue. All right. So if the exception doesn't apply or it was lawful and so therefore it gets admitted, are there any other reasons that you might be able to exclude it if you're acting for the person that behaved very badly and you're thinking, oh, no, how can I get this recording struck out? There are. Section 135 is a general discretion um, to exclude evidence and this is where the probative value of the evidence substantially outweighs the danger that the evidence might be unfairly prejudicial, misleading, confusing or a waste of time. So different from 138 which just required it to outweigh, this is a substantially outweigh. So you, you're going to have to be really clear here, what is the probative value? You're going to have to be able to articulate that and then if your client's the one that's suffering the prejudice, it will, everyone suffers prejudice in adversarial proceedings. Prejudice isn't enough. It has to be unfairly prejudicial. Maybe the circumstances of unfairness come from the fact that um, it ha hasn't been disclosed, this is the first time you're hearing about it in the final hearing, your client would have gone into evidence about it if they'd known about it. Those might be the kind of circumstances that are unfairly prejudicial. There are, um, I'll just sort of throw it into the mix, any of us know that... You you leave somebody legally aided or indeed private, um, a matter is flicked, lands in, in your lap fairly soon or before the matter goes to a hearing. So you don't have much time. 
you've got to put on something fairly quickly because there's directions to get your trial affidavit in and you're just interested in getting the information out there. But what this shows is the importance that you've really just got to be a bit careful about getting information and lumping it into a document. Make sure you're thinking about what's going in and what the ramifications are going to be, potentially. You'll find that most of the case law will work through, um, number one, is it even in breach of the Surveillance Device Act? So does it, is it a private conversation, for example? If you jump through that hoop, does the, do any of the exemptions apply? Then go through 138, and in the alternative, if I'm wrong in that, then I can consider it under 135. So you'll find that a lot of the judges um, sort of use that logical sequence. But in family law, there's this great case from 2020, Nagel and Clay, it's Justice Harper. Um, it's what I would call a Michael Carney special. He was acting for the applicant father. And it's the circumstances of this are really important. It's um, a voir dire in advance of the final hearing happening. So the applicant father had actually asked for an advance ruling on particular recordings. Mum wanted to rely on eight hours of recordings um, and Dad wanted an advance ruling on that because Mum wanted to send it to the expert. In fact, the, the expert had already uh, looked at it despite knowing that there was an argument about the admissibility of it. And so then a side issue came about of should there be a fresh ex expert so in that particular case, in addition to Section 138 and 135 of the Evidence Act, um, Michael Carney argued and Justice Harper accepted that there were other bases that in the Family Law Act and in the rules that you might be able to exclude. So I've never seen any other cases that have tried to argue there were other powers, but in um, Division 12A proceedings, there's a specific Section 69ZX, subsection 2, which gives general power to the court to be able to give directions about how evidence is to be given and how it's not to be given. And uh, Justice Harper specifically says that that section is so wide that it could exclude material that um, would otherwise not be excluded under Section 138 or 135. And in fact, in Nagel and Clay, he does exclude it on that basis. So it's an important little section to note. The other rule that's important in family law rules um, 8.18, which allows the court to strike out objectionable material if it's scandalous or inadmissible. And again, in Nagel and Clay, Justice Harper said he was going to um, strike it out under that rule as well. He was re referring to the old one, um, which was 15.13 under the family law rules at the time. But part of it's, I really commend reading the case to you. Part of the reason that he goes through is that, so the eight hours weren't before him, but he gets a snippet of them and the snippet of them, most of them is the mum driving or the mum walking around. Some of it is recordings of the father saying things where he's not behaving badly. Some of it is the father hugging the children and being really affectionate with them as well. So his honour basically said that it had low probative value overall and low importance. And he says that um, he didn't want to make a determination on Section 138. His Honour was concerned about doing that in the context of um, before a final hearing. He didn't want there to be any kind of adverse comment on the mother. You can understand why. He's thinking that if he says anything about 138, maybe there'll be a recusal application. Um, but he does say that he would have he would otherwise exclude it under 135. I think... Um... Again, when it comes to recordings, you've really got to sort of think about what the recording's supposed to go to. Uh, I had a matter just recently where there were three recordings put in by the mother. One was a sound recording and the other two were videos, but none of them really went to anything. There was um, her talking to the father, in essence, trying to bait him um, and get him to become aggro. It doesn't happen. It goes for about 10 minutes. And he just sort of answers back a little bit, curses a couple of times, and that's it. But it doesn't seem to go to anything else. Um, the two video recordings, one was him standing at the front door that he turned up um, uh, to have a chat to or pick up one of the kids, I can't remember. And he says a few things and she says a few things. It's not argumentative. There's no yelling and screaming. There's no banging down doors. It doesn't seem to go to anything. The third um, was a recording of the father... Um, with the child in the back seat in a restraint chair um, and he's videoing himself 
and the child. Now, the mother objected to that on the basis that he, he should be driving um, uh, the car, not recording things. He said, well, it's on a, it's on a, a, a safety cam anyway. I just reversed it around. So it was filming. I didn't have to do anything. I'm still driving the car. But again, it didn't seem to go to anything, really, other than perhaps um, he's recording and having jokes with his daughter. Uh, so think carefully about if you're going to put something in, make sure there's a reason why. And in particular, just because it, you know, let's say you're successful, you manage to reduce the evidence that's let in, don't think that it will always work in your client's favour. Usually the courts have um, been concerned about people that have decided to resort to making covert recordings. What does that say about their character? That um, the covert recording, if it does um, record interactions between parents, the person making the recording usually is on their best behaviour because they know the recording's happening. Although I've had cases where um, they're not on their best behaviour because they can't even control themselves. And so when the evidence gets adduced, you're thinking, oh, great, it's bad for both, both parents. Um, so just be warned that just because you get it in, it, it might not actually be a good thing. It might actually work against you. And we've got a case on that, the Gaznijak and Regola, um, where recordings were admitted um, despite the negative conclusions made about the father because the recordings uh, the judge said were largely theatrical and manipulative. He, did, in essence, tried to bait the mother. And given the father's propensity to exaggerate um, in collecting and saving recordings for possible evidence, um, I treat the father's allegations about abuse against him with a great degree of caution. Um, so I think general takeaways should include that, um, particularly in cases where there's family violence, where it's so insidious, it happens behind doors, um, the court seems to be more willing to let that sort of covert recording in. And it either gets admitted in um, because it's under lawful interests or section 138. But um, coming back to your point, when has there ever been sort of criminal proceedings We've found at least one case where they have. There is, and it's our last slide, and we'll finish up on this. Um, there's a case of Leo, Leos and Leos, again anonymised, um, a family court uh, Greek. Where, <laughs> where, where the father was subsequently arrested and received an 18-month bond and a $1,000 fine, where his recordings um, that he sought to tender in the case, uh, alleging the mother's abuse, were not admitted um, because she'd um, already admitted behaviour in evidence of another party. So he was subsequently fined, which leads to the question, how does this come about? How is somebody fined um, under, under the Act? Um, it can really only happen two ways. One is it's referred by the judge. Um, and I was speaking to a judge the other day about this, and he said, I would never um, refer a matter, regardless of, of what's contained, um, uh, to, really? to the police. He said, yeah, I just don't see the point. Um, he said it antagonises the parties um, in circumstances where he may have final orders or otherwise, depending on what's about. Because remember, um, if it's admitted, that's fine, there's an exemption. But if it's not, um, then the recording's out there and it's been illegally obtained. Um, so who then is going to report it? Well, it can only be the aggrieved party that then goes and reports it to the police and says, oh, you know, th this guy's got, got the recordings, they shouldn't have it. And the police then charge them. Um, so be careful. It, it, breach of Section 7 of the Surveillance Device Act has a penalty of 500 units or five years in prison. Um, I certainly haven't seen any cases where anyone's ended up in prison over it. Um, but I think the main takeaway is you should not be encouraging your clients to do this. And um, maybe when you're having the first conference with them, if you even get a hint that this is something that they are doing, you should be discouraging them from doing that and warning them of all of the dangers that can come from it, including the criminal ramifications. So that's it from us. Um, thank you so much for attending. Um, questions? I'm having a look to see if we've got any on the live chat. But questions? I know we've had a pretty interactive session anyway. Thank you all for coming along. Thanks for coming. Please join us for canapes and drinks. Thank you.